Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank Andrew for inviting me and uh, to thank all the PopTech folks for being such delightful hosts. So as Andrew mentioned, I come to you from the world of public health science. So I'm going to talk about resilience and health. I'm going to build on some of Andrew's ideas, but I'm going to try to narrow us down to how does resilience play out in health, with the point, of course, to understand how we can promote resilience, how we can make sure that we are all resilient and our societies are resilient. So having said that, let me plunge right in. Andrew gave you a definition of resilience, and um, I want to give you mine, which actually, as you'll see, complements his. I think resilience is something that's happening when some bad stuff is happening. I think we're, we're, we all understand that. Andrew gave the example of um, Iceland as a bad crisis. We can think of a trauma. We can think of a disaster. But resilience, very explicitly, is bouncing back. It is something happens and we bounce back. And let me just show you a schema on this, and I'm going to use the schema several times in my talk. If you think of the y-axis as badness, you can think of it as post-traumatic stress, which is something that we study a lot in my lab. What happens is you're moving along, you're moving along quite happily, and then something happens, and you develop this bad thing, let's say post-traumatic stress. But then over time, you come back and you go back to the way you were. Andrew mentioned this notion that you can even come back better, but let's leave that aside for a second. The point is that resilience is something's happening, you, something bad happens to you as a result, but eventually you bounce back. Now, when I say that, what I think is not made explicit often enough is that resilience is then by definition a path, it's a trajectory. If resilience is bouncing back, and notice how I just showed you this picture over time, you cannot understand resilience by looking only at a point in time. If you look at Iceland today only, you would not understand its resilience. You need to understand it over the lens of since 2008 to see what happened and how it responded. And it's exactly the same thing with human beings. Now when I say that, when I say resilience is a path, what is embedded in that is that resilience is not the only path. In fact, there could be many other paths after trauma or bad things happen. So this is a path of chronic dysfunction. You're moving along here, something happens, and you develop this badness in health, let's say post-traumatic stress, and you keep it. That is a path of chronic dysfunction. You can have a path of resistance. Something, path, something bad happens and nothing happens to you. You keep going along the same way you were. You can have a relapsing, remitting path that as something bad happens, you get some symptoms, you get better, you get worse. Or you can have something that's like delayed dysfunction, that you seem to be okay for a while, and then bad things happen. And of course, you can also have resilience, where you don't do well, and over time you recover. So the reason I'm making this point is that when we think about resilience, we have to think of it as one path among many, really with the point to understanding how is it that we can make ourselves get to that path. It is a desired path among many, so how can we maximize how many of us get to that path when something happens? If we don't think of resilience as a path, I think the challenge is that this happens. That is, you always happens with this slide. Um, if you look at the slide, <laughs> You look at the slide, and you know what this is? Anybody know what this is? No, you don't know what this is, because what this is is a piece of a larger picture. So if we do not understand that resilience is one path among many, we cannot really understand how we can maximize our likelihood of ending up on that path, how we can make sure that populations end up on that path. Now, I've said all this theoretically. So let me show you a concrete example so you can actually see how resilience operates in, a, in real life. And this is, of course, I'm going to use an example from the September 11 terrorist attacks, which is something about which our lab did quite a bit of work. And I'm going to show you some examples from our own work around post-traumatic stress as just one marker of resilience. I echo Andrew's point that post-traumatic stress is not all there is, but I'm going to use it here as a convenient marker for the sake of the science. So. There's been a lot written about bouncing back after September 11. These are some, some illustrations. Broadway bounces back. 
Jerome uh, Giuliani, Survivors Blossom, and all that. We studied post-traumatic stress in New York City after the attacks. And this is the picture of what happened to PTSD after the attacks. What you see is it was initially went down, and then eventually it settled in this long-term path. But what we were able to do is we're able to break this apart. If you take this apart into the constituent groups, what you get is that there were people in multiple different paths. Now, I know you're looking at this and it looks like a lot of spaghetti. But if you think back for a second to the paths I just showed you, you can recognize that on this picture, there are all these other different paths. You see over here, you have chronic dysfunction. Over here, you have recovery. You have moderate dysfunction. You have resistance. And this path here is the path of resilience. And we have documented this after other events, that you have multiple paths that people take, that people's health takes after trauma or bad things. And resilience is one of those paths. It's a desirable path, but it's one of those paths. Now, let me just take a step back for a second and say, why does this matter? Now, in some respects, my job is easy on this, because Andrew came before me, and he showed you pictures of things burning and talked about Iceland and things like that. But let me just take us a step back. And I'll just start with the obvious. This is Hurricane Katrina. 2005 resulted in tremendous publicity, something that we talk about, we talked about a lot, resulted in these horrific pictures that were a shame for this country and really a shame for the world. And we all know that one of the results of Hurricane Katrina were large parts of Louisiana and Mississippi were declared disaster areas. This map shows you those areas that were declared disaster areas. But let me ask you this question. Did you know that these areas that were declared disaster areas were equivalent in size to the entire United Kingdom. So Hurricane Katrina, one event, was the equivalent, and you can do the math yourself. You can just you know, Google surface area, disaster areas, and you can get the same equation. And uh, th these are events that affect enormously large number of people. And this is just one illustration. Now, the problem with disasters is they're bad things. They happen, we talk about them a lot, and then you know what? We forget all about them. Now you're all saying that's not true, I remember. Okay then. What were the biggest disasters in 2011? Just last year. Uh, we're not gonna do hand raising because I actually can't see you because I have bright lights in my eyes, but uh, <laughs> I have a feeling you're there because unless there's a laugh track, you're there. Um, just think about it in your own heads for a second. Think about this. I'm just gonna pause for five seconds. What was the largest disaster in, in, in last, last year? I'm not saying 10 years ago, last year. Now, think in your heads. What was the second largest disaster last year? Ah, silence now. The largest disaster was indeed Fukushima. It was Japan tsunami, 20,000 people died. Who remembered that the second largest disaster was 1,500 people dying from a cyclone in the Philippines? Anybody? No. Now wait. Let me go a step further still. Forget about number of people dying. Think of disasters from the point of view of number of victims, people affected, people displaced, people whose lives are appended. What was the largest disaster? Which, forget about what was the largest disaster. Think about which country was the largest disaster last year. Think about which country had the second largest one. Think about which country had the third largest one. Does anybody remember that the four largest disasters in 2011 were all in China, and they resulted in displacement of tens of millions of people? We did not, right? I mean, I did not until I looked it up. So the point is that these events happen. They are large events. We talk about them, then we forget about them, which is, of course, a problem if we are to fully understand the consequences of bad stuff. And the other problem is that the number of disasters in the world is increasing, and has been increasing for the past 30 years. Now. The other challenge with thinking about trauma is this notion that, yeah, I get it. I get it that there's bad stuff. I get it that there's resilience. But bad things never happen to me. They happen to other people. Unfortunately, separate and apart from the merits of this book, which sold four million copies, by the way, is that it's ingrained in our minds that bad things happen to other people, and sometimes they happen to good people. Well, is that true? If this is the world, this is the United States, or the America, and the number of people who actually have at least one traumatic event in their lifetime is all the red people. And the choice of red and blue here is completely incidental. The 90% um, <laughs> of people, 
that slides work so much better in election season. Okay, 90% 90, <laughs> 90 of people in this country will have a traumatic event in their lifetime. And in some populations, 50% have a traumatic event in the past year. So these are not unusual events. Trauma is common. Trauma happens to all of us. And it is something that we need to understand how we respond to it, how we can understand how we can bounce back. So you're all asking, well, then what causes resilience? I'm going to run through five things very quickly, some data from our labs, just for illustrative purposes. And because I'm a scientist, I feel like I have to show you data from our lab. So your genes a little bit. One of the best ways to make sure you are resilient is to be born, choose to be born with good genes. That's very important. This is something called the Manhattan plot. All you need to see here is that you see there's like one red dot over there, this one gene that we've identified as associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, which might have a role in resilience. Forget about genes, biology. Some of the most exciting work in this area is about something called epigenetics, where the gene expression is modulated by changing protein structure around DNA. And what's exciting about it is that we can show that that is changed by trauma. And it's also transmitted from mother to offspring. So this slide, all I want you to see here is that this is the response of a particular gene by different methylation values. The gene expression changes due to epigenetics. Your parents, your childhood. I understand that everybody knows that parents matter. But what we're finding is this. Look at this slide. What this shows is as follows. These are number of symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder in children conditioned on number of symptoms in the mother. And what you see here, as you go this way, you have more symptoms of the mother. And the darker the color, more symptoms in the children. You see how these darker colors are increasing? Given the same life experience of a child, a child will have more, will do worse if her mother or his mother also had poor functioning. And we're just beginning to understand this. Central to all this is your own experiences. One trauma is, worse, is, is better than two traumas, which is better than three, which is better than four. It sounds self-evident, but so often we forget this. This is number of traumas, likelihood of post-traumatic stress. The worse things are, the worse you are. There's been this notion that's been battered around about inoculation. If many bad things happen to you, you're inoculated among future bad things. The science really does not bear that out. The science suggests that the more bad things, the worse it is. Now here's the unpopular slide. Stochasticity, which is randomness. We would like to think that we can control. We can control things. We can control resilience. There is a lot of randomness. Luck matters. And I, I don't have a human slide to show you about luck. It's very hard to show luck in humans. So I'm going to show it to you my next favorite species, which is crayfish. These are crayfish. Why am I showing you crayfish? The reason I'm showing you crayfish is because these three crayfish are genetically identical and raised in identical circumstances. And you see how different they look? The reason they look different is simply randomness. And your community. Your community matters. This slide's from a paper we published. You see these two crossing lines? What the two crossing lines are are different functions of genes depending on the type of community you live in. That the same genetic structure can operate differently, can be protective, or can be harmful if you live, in this case, in a rich versus a poor community. And ultimately, it's a combination of all these factors that probably drive resilience. That if we want to understand resilience, we need to understand how to manipulate all these factors. Which, of course, brings us to the next question, which is what we really want to know is I said resilience is one path. I said that resilience is a preferred path. But the question is, how do we increase resilience then? And can we? And the debate in the field is really bipolar. There is one poll which is focusing a lot on this, which is the yes, we can debate. This is, if you go on the web, you just type in, just, just Google for a second, improving resilience. And you will find a lot of people who are willing to sell you a lot of ways to improve resilience. I would suggest you invest your money in the Icelandic stock market, because that's on the way up. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around this notion of personalized medicine, that we are going to identify genes and identify how to pinpoint genes that will actually make things better. I, I, I'm loath to take positions on this in such a brief talk, but I, I just want to make the point that 
even if genes are an answer, they are a small part of a much more complex answer. That pinpointing genes and this dream that I'm going to get a genetic test and you're going to tell me what my gene is, so you can tell me exactly what I'm going to do, is unlikely to make resilience ever, let alone in our lifetimes. Or is this an alternative? This is a, this is a slide of a fairly benighted urban area. What if we improve communities? What if we improve the environment to make it much more positive, much more welcoming environment? Is this a right approach to improving resilience? And obviously, the answer is probably a bit of both. We need to understand the individual, but we also need to understand the community. But I'm, I want to I end with this question. What makes sense? What if we improved resilience in populations? Conceptually, what would be an approach for us to roll up our sleeves and delve into improving resilience? And I want you to work with me for a second and think of the world this way. This is a bell curve. You've all heard of the bell curve. And what this is, is any form of risk factor you can think of. So let's just say this can be genes, this can be community factors, but let's just make it easy. Let's say it's number of bad things that happen to you in your life, okay? Remember I showed you the slide that said five is worse than four, worse than three, worse than two? So let's assume that this is 10, this is zero, okay? And this is number of people in the population. As with everything else, there are very few people who have a lot of bad things happen to them. There are very few people who have the charmed people who have very few things, bad things happen to them. And most of us are somewhere in the middle, right? So that's the bell curve of the population. Supposing our approach to improving resilience was one where we focused only on those people at risk, what would we do? What we would do is we would come up with a cutoff line and say, you know what, here's the cutoff. And if you've had four traumas, we are going to try to work with you to help you get more resilient. If you've had four traumas, we will give you all sorts of stuff. By the way, if you've had three traumas, forget about it. You're going to be OK. You're all laughing. Like, we don't do this? Let me ask you this question. Again, you don't need to raise your hand. How many of you have ever been to a healthcare provider to get screened for anything? Let's say cholesterol. When you go to the healthcare provider to get screened for cholesterol, what happens? She takes your blood and gets a cholesterol level. And what does she say? She either says, your cholesterol's fine. You can go, go ahead and eat your Big Macs. Or else, she says, your cholesterol's not fine. You need to stop eating Big Macs. And here's a pill, right? Isn't that what happens? What is she doing? She's deciding whether you are to the right or left of the line. That's all she's doing. So this is actually the entire biomedical enterprise. This is how it operates. Is there an alternative? Sure, there's an alternative. What if instead of operating over here, what we did is we shifted the curve? What if we shifted the curve and see what happens here? See all these people? They're no longer there. They're now here. They're now on the safer part of the line. Now you're all saying, how can we shift the curve? There's many ways to shift the curve. How do we shift the curve of number of traumas? Make our community safer. Let me go back to cholesterol for a second. How do you shift the curve of cholesterol? Anybody? Make Big Macs illegal. <coughs> that will do it. I, I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying we could if we wanted to. All right, can this be done? Yes, it can be done. This is from a famous uh, a study in Finland where they actually did shift the curve of cholesterol. And you see here the curve before and after their intervention. So we can do it if we want to. The question is, is it important enough for us as a society? Does it rise to the level of imperative? And I would argue that in the context of understanding how important resilience is as a trajectory for positive health and for positive well-being, positive functioning of our society, we should, which is why I think a meeting like this is important. It is important that we have a dialogue about what drives resilience so that we may actually make for a healthier and better world. Thank you.